Good evening. How's everyone doing on this February winter night? Um, as part of the, the um, yeah, welcome to the first uh, Writer Speak Southampton we've had in several years in person. Um, it's, it's nice to be back in person and uh, to be rebuilding this, this program. Uh, it's designed to bring contemporary writers onto campus and all our students and our community um, the opportunity to hear and be in conversation with them. And so it is also running in Manhattan. Uh, we have a Manhattan Center for those of you who are not just out here but also in the city. Uh, that, that program is run by Robert Lopez and uh, you can find out information on, on both this schedule and our Manhattan schedule on our websites, which is stonybrook.edu forward slash MFA, and just click on the events page and you can see what's going on there. You can also follow us and watch this reading as well as any of the other readings on YouTube uh, on our MFA writing channel. Um, so this is a special Writers Speak event and really one of the great reasons we had asked this person to come is because um, it is always wonderful to have an alum. Um, and, and sort of we're doubly lucky because actually our second Writer Speak Southampton event is actually also going to be an alum. And uh, if you let us brag for a second, between fall 2023 and spring, summer 2024, we'll have five of our alums will be publishing books. Uh, some of them their second or third and it's just sort of a really just makes us so happy and fills us with such pride to have our alums succeed and and to have them come back and sort of share their success and share their trials with us uh, and and most importantly share their work with us so um, and what sort of makes tonight even more exciting is that Vanessa has been sort of with us for over a decade in, in I think, six or seven different forms. Um, first, as a, first as an undergrad, actually, but then uh, as a conference participant, as an MFA student, as a volunteer for the literary magazine TSR, uh, and a member of the inaugural cohort of the Bookends program. And in fact, this year, uh, Vanessa is actually going to be one of our Bookends mentors. So as they say, you know, the student becomes the master. Um, or the master's student becomes the master. Uh, Vanessa's fiction has appeared uh, in the Best American Short Stories 2021, the Kenyan Review, Agni, West Branch, Indiana Review, and others. Uh, tonight she'll be reading from The Tip Line, her debut novel. Please welcome Vanessa Cutie. <laughs> going to read from the beginning. This sounds so loud. I just wanted to get married, start my life like anyone else. I was 30, single, drinking wine every night while I swiped my way through online dating sites. I was between jobs. It sounds better when I say it that way. I was between jobs in that I had just left one and I hadn't yet found another. I was renting a cottage at the back of an estate. It was private and had its own driveway, but still. Part of the agreement was that I had to pick up the mail and the newspaper for the owner of the big house and walk it up to the porch. There was a box marked mail just in case I forgot this one task, in case I got all the way there and was wondering what I had come for. He called it the big house, the owner did. He slapped around in slippers and met me at the door sometimes. He was in his 50s and married to a much younger woman, and I saw her leave for yoga some mornings. And sometimes I saw her milling around their large yard, her hands behind her back, looking for a project, something to start in and on. Her life seemed to me to be easy and very straightforward. If you have a life like that, you cannot in good conscience complain. My two best girlfriends were well into their first pregnancies posting photos of their stretched bellies and their husbands leaning over to kiss these bellies or leaning back and sticking their own bellies out, pretending to be pregnant too. Fear, they wrote on themselves with marker, with an arrow pointing down. 
how could you not roll your eyes? They posted photos of shoes, wife shoes, husband shoes, baby shoes, in blue, in pink, pictures of nurseries, giraffes and trains and rocking chairs positioned in golden afternoon sun, cushions so deep you could imagine the plush coming up around your hips while you sat for hours and watched your child breathe. Look at that, beautiful. I could hear their voices, see their heads shaking in unison at me while they bit their bottom lips in turn. You have to be open-minded, Virginia, not so picky. What you think is important now totally changes, and your priorities become so different. Looks don't matter, money doesn't matter. You just need someone who loves you as a person, someone who makes you happy. Yes, right, open mind. We hardly spoke anymore, what with their priorities happening all around them. But if we did talk, this is what they would have said to me, like they were sitting me down. This is why, all of these things. This is why I had to take the job at the police department. I just wasn't on track. Or I was on track, but it was the wrong one. A little behind on my life plan, as my mother would sometimes say. She said, just a little behind, that's all. She said, this job will be the perfect place for you to meet a nice man. She said, like shooting fish in a barrel. I am not the type of person to think in terms of a life plan, but I was not in an ideal situation and I knew it. And here it was, a way to meet people and put myself out there and find a nice man. Or at that point, any man really, a man who could turn into a husband, a house, kids, on and on. I was trying to make things right. I had this idea that there would be a perceptible beginning it was just this sense. While driving there on my first day, I figured I would walk into the building and things would be immediately changed. That the front door was some sort of portal to an after and everything else a before. The whole way there and for days prior, a thump thump of nerves in my stomach, a cat's twitching tail, the catalyst of a new chemistry, my new chemistry. Here I am, it said, spelled out in slowly moving mixed up letters and then sliding into place like on a screen at the beginning of a movie. And there I was, ready for everything, grown, new, happy, capable. I was early, so I sat there, AM radio on low, blowing on my coffee, preparing. I was wearing a new gray suit, a pale blue button-up blouse, and new black leather pumps. I had a decent overcoat, a gift for my parents. I had washed my hair, blow dried it, parted it in the center and tucked it behind my ears. I tried to detach from myself, to see myself objectively as a stranger would see me. I closed my eyes and cleared my throat, ridding myself of my opinion, and then I opened my eyes like I could catch a glimpse if I did it quickly enough, the cloak of a ghost, something elusive. But what I saw, I looked like a child's idea of a grown-up a bank teller or a receptionist from a photograph in a brochure or an illustration on an exam, mousy and simple and boring. This wouldn't work. I tried to run my hand through my hair, part it on the side so it fell a little loose, and then, what a disaster. It stuck out away from the side of my head, a puff above my ear. I shook my head and saw a woman on the phone in the car next to me watching. She didn't look away when our eyes met. I just left it. There was nothing ceremonial as I got out of the car and crossed the parking lot. It was too cold. The wind slid open the front of my coat and then lifted the flaps of it one at a time. Then it went into the buttonholes, into the places between the buttons, touching. My fingertips and face felt numb by the time I made it across. There were tears in my eyes. I held the front door open for a uniformed officer behind me and then I don't know, I got nervous. I got nervous back then in the presence of police. I got nervous and dropped my purse and banged my head on the door handle going down to pick up the things that had fallen out. A lip gloss, a small hairbrush, and a compact mirror from which the top half had broken, up, had broken off. Jesus, are you all right? The cop said, stooping down. He was young, earnest, clean shaven to the point of shining. I'm fine, I said. My head throbbed. I could feel the push of blood there, trying to shape itself into a bump. It must have been something in the way I said, fine. He must have seen how red my face was, 
that I was sweating, really disturbed by the whole thing. He must have heard my heart going nuts because he stood up and backed away and just said, okay, as he left. What a story that could have been for grandchildren. What an adorable story. A meet cute for a newspaper piece on her 50th anniversary, and I had ruined it. Not a surprise. Inside, I felt my new chemistry shift. The small spark which I had finally lit against the wind was flickering, fixing to go out. Do not stop, I wanted to say. Please, let's try again. I was superstitious. Still am. I don't like to start things off wrong. It sets the stage for everything to come. I considered going out to the car and then coming back in, do over, but I stood up and brushed off my front as though I had fallen in the dirt. I imagined the wiping clean of a blackboard, a towel on a window, a net cutting through the muck that scummed the top of a swimming pool. Visualize, imagine. Around me, people moved about, waited online for pistol licenses, walked in and out of the restroom. I heard the toilet flush and gurgle. I smelled a hundred perfumes. I was fine, fine. I was ready again. No one seemed to be watching. No one had seen. The chemicals started back up. I sat down, crossed my legs at the ankle like a lady. I touched the softness where I'd hit my head and imagined that if I pressed hard enough, I could poke a finger clean through. So uh, we're going to open up for a little Q and A. Um, if anyone has any questions, I can I can get it started. Uh, so in the first sentence, you sort of establish exactly what um, Virginia wants. Was that something that you came to later, or did you always know sort of what the first the, what you were going to do in the first chapter and the first sentence? Um, that's a really good question. I, I must have internalized at some point, like when people teach you about writing and they say that your characters have to want something or like have a goal. And I took the simplest route to get there and just say in the first line, I don't know. I think, um, I guess it was sort of like the, the engine driving the rest of the book. If she wanted this bad enough, it could make her overlook all the other things that she sort of ignores. Um, so I, I know I, I've asked you this question before and I'm still looking for the answer. I, I think you have a remarkable gift for pacing and I don't, I don't quite get how you build a paragraph and build a scene. There's something, of, is it, I mean, is, is this happening in your, in your brain or your ear or are you, like, are you aware of how well you pace things and how do you do it? I ask again. <laughs> that is very nice. Thank you. Um, I don't know that I think about it. It's not something that I am conscious of. I think this is so weird, but I think like when I'm writing something, there's like a feeling in my mouth almost, like you can almost like chew on the words, like and you know when it, you know when it like clicks in and it's just. I don't know, sometimes when I go back in revision and I see stuff and I'm like, oh, this is overkill. Like it probably sounded good at the time and I got swept up in it. Um, and you know, I cut that out, but I think it's like that sort of organic kind of impulse where you can like feel the, I don't know what it is that you feel, I guess like the, the heat of the story. I don't know. I, I guess I'm always thinking of what's in service to the story and that's, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> it's just funny, you have such a, um, you, just, you just go from A to A to A to A to B to B to B. You just, it's a, you're just so confident in the way you move through a scene. And that's, I understand that's what's so fascinating. I mean, I do cut a lot out. I, you know, it, 
doesn't start this way. But I do think as I'm writing, you know, even if I'm in the middle of a draft, I'll go back and start from the beginning every time and cut things out. And it's so like, I don't wait till the end of a draft to go back and edit. Like I'll, every time I open my computer, I'll go back and start and keep going and always cut and just like polish, polish, polish. And then I think a lot of the times I lose stuff from the beginning because I'm so sick of reading it and it's not in service to the rest of the story. So I guess um, I'm always sort of like cutting it down. I don't know. Just going on that, uh, you you have this ability to stay in a moment. You know, there's, there's early in the book, there is a scene where um, one of the officers brings her a cup of coffee and then she spills it and then he tries to help wipe it up and then he leaves and that's essentially the scene like that's the the physical action in the scene but the scene is so built up in her mind about every single moment and everything that's going wrong and things that are going right and how it, how it should be going and again is is that is that building something that you're doing while writing initially or is that in in sort of going through as in edits and rewrites I think things like that, like I knew I wanted her to be really embarrassed and really human in that moment. And just, um, I wanted it to almost be cringy for the reader. Like, oh, this girl is like such a wreck. And um, just like, let's just make her suffer through this. And it's like all of her clothes and he tries to wipe it up and it's worse. So I think like for that, it was like, she needed to be really vulnerable in that moment. And I think I don't know I guess thinking back now I wanted to show like some sort of change in the character from this bumbling like cringy to someone who sort of takes charge and you know that sort of sort of change hi thank you hi. Um, I was just curious about the the book itself you know how long it took you to write how many revisions and drafts you had to go through and what um, what you found helpful along the way what was what helped you keep going along the way mm. I don't know if you really want to know the answer to this question it's like discouraging but um, I, I wrote the original the the first draft really I, it was like nine weeks or something um, once I had the idea um, you know, I knew I wanted it to be based on the Long Island serial killer. And I'm like, how am I going to get to this? Like, and then I thought, well, let's make it like kind of secondary to the plot point. You, you know, like that's like, let's bury that and have it based on this girl. Um, so I wrote the original draft really quickly. Uh, but then um, I, I was having like, agent problems at that time. So I left my first agent before going on submission with it. Um, then I had to get a new agent and we had to go through revisions and we were on submission for like 16 months. We got a lot of feedback during that time. We did two revise and resubmits. We totally changed the book, totally changed the ending. That The ending was so different and I sent it actually to Susie and Susie's like, what is this ending? No, make her get married. I'm like, oh my God. So, um, so much revision and um, it, it all ended up obviously for the, the better of the book, um, but it was a really, really long road and um, not smooth. What kept you going along the way? So, um, I, have, I have shelved many, many other things. I've shelved, I don't know, three other novels, a book of short stories. Like this book was like the book of my heart. And I said, I don't care who publishes this. I this I'm like gonna die on this cross. Like this needs to go somewhere. So I will do whatever you tell me. You tell me to make this happen, I will revise. Like so I just wanted it. I believed in it so much. Like I still have such a soft spot for it. It's like, you know, like your first the baby book metaphors some you know it's like so tired but it's like you just have a vision for something that you love and you just can't give up on it and it's you know it sounds so trite but it's like really if you believe in something and you it's your your love you just you'll find a you know you just 
keep pushing and people give you feedback and sometimes it makes it better and you take what resonates and you just have a vision and go there. But you know, it's some people have a charmed path and some people don't and I do not. <laughs> Um, so, uh, my question is, um, how for, when you said you had an idea, then my question is how formed on the scale of forms of an idea, some people have a, a feeling and some people have like, you know, 20 page outline of how every scene is going to go. Is mm -hmm. where does your original idea is it, and is it still there? And so what was the nature of the idea? Like, what makes that idea? So I wish I could be an outliner, but I'm, n I'm really not an outliner. Um, I feel like it would really streamline things and make my life easier. I, I just had an idea that, I don't know, I was just really compelled by this huge idea of a serial killer in, you know, on Long Island, like this populous area close to the city. You know, I worked at the police station when this happened, so it was really prompted by that. Um, I, I answered the anonymous tip line while I was working at the police department. Um, so I was like, this is so wild. And what was most compelling to me is that people would call this tip line and give information about their husbands, their ex-husbands, their neighbors, and I'm like, this is a woman calling about her husband. Like, what point do you have to get to psychologically where you say, I think I'm going to call this 800 number and talk to a stranger about my husband potentially being involved in, you know? And I just thought, like, wow. How does that happen? And you never really know someone you're married to. Like, I don't know. Those are, like, all the ideas that were swimming in my head. And I, of course, the path of least resistance, oh, well, I worked at the tip line, so let's kind of just use my experience because I'm not like a big research person. Um, so it was just those, that was the basis of it. Like I, that never, you know, not knowing your spouse and being unsure to the point where you call someone. So I knew it was, it was that was like the nexus of it. So vague, nebulous. So then, when did you decide that the main character would have this sort of desperate need to get married and sort of this one-track mind on it? Um, so I think she was, you know, at this formative age, which was 30, which, you know, 10 years ago, 13 years ago, I was 30, and things were a little different then, and it was still, like, very expected that by, by 30 years old, you would kind of be settled in, there was this sort of societal expectation that you would, at least, you know, in, in my circles and my family and my friends, you know, my friends were all getting married at 30 and it was like a, a pressure there. So I thought, you know, there's, there's the ticking clock, like there's your ticking clock. And that's another thing that, um, you know, the want and the ticking clock. And now I have some some supplies for my recipe here, so. Thank you. I, I, I kind of had a question in that vein because I was fascinated even by the part that you just read about how much you've built up as far as her you know, goal to get married, but it seems like a lot of her context is women and comparing herself to other women mm -hmm. and, um, you know, she doesn't have a right to complain or my mother thinks this or my mother thinks that. Maybe going back to character, was that something that you built into the character from the beginning, this kind of deep need to impress other women or is that something that developed over the course of the novel? Um, I think she, the character is very, uh, self-conscious and insecure and just sort of at the beginning of the book, I think she's very um, unsure of what she wants. Does she even want to get married to get married? Does she want to get married because everyone else is getting married? Why is it important to get married? 
Um, who cares if you don't get married? You know, um, I think as the book goes on, it sort of veers sharply away from that desire, um, almost as it goes sharply towards it. Uh, I think she figures out a lot about um, control and power and, um, you know, dyn the dynamic in relationships. Um, so I think in the beginning, it's very... Um, she, she's very unsure of what she wants, but I, I hope that as the book goes on, it's sort of, she becomes more fully aware and sort of embraces it. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much, Vanessa. Thank you. <laughs> I, I believe that probably um, Southampton Books or some of the local bookstores have it or they can order it for you yeah. or bookshop.org or that other place that rhymes with Spamazon. Um, uh, um, also, just a reminder that our next uh, writer speak in Southampton is March 20th with a uh, alum poet, Anthony DiPietro. And I believe the next one in Manhattan is March 6th. Um, so uh, hopefully you'll join us for one of those two readings as well. All right, thank you again. <laughs>